good conversation to be in. For those of you who are joining us pretty much for the first time or who haven't been in the conversation and you might feel I'm stepping into the middle of a conversation that's already happening, that's okay. Every one of us get born into a conversation that God has already started with humanity. And by the time we get to be able to engage, he's already said a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, there's a lot of things that we can pick up on. Um, I know that God loves you just the way you are. I, I think you need to acknowledge and embrace that and realize that. But as one of my good friends says, God loves you too much just to leave you the way you are. In fact, he wants you to change. So he's loving you into change. You know, John Maxwell says that uh, people change when they hurt enough to have to change. Yeah, that's true. I've been at those kinds of places, and uh, it has been painful, but it has brought me to a place of change. Secondly, he says people change when they know enough to be empowered or enabled to change. But the part of that quote that very few people remember is the third phrase, that's the third statement he makes. People change permanently when they are loved into change. You only need to look at a marriage that's been going for 45, maybe 50 years and see how these two people, because of the love they have for each other, have been permanently changed. They are no longer the kind of person they were when they were in their flirty 30s or <laughs> what naughty 40s or wherever it may be. They've changed radically. They've become quality people. And I think that's what the... Uh, wedding at Cana is trying to tell us how water turns into wine. Marriage will do that to you. You come into marriage as a tasteless, odorless, colorless individual. And God takes and changes the nature of your character until you become like the most exhilarating wine. Your company, your presence, the character and the quality of who you are is so deep and rich and powerful. This is where God is going with his church. Stefan, none of that was on any of the slides. Don't bother. That, that, yeah, that was for no extra charge whatsoever. So you're getting your money's worth and more this morning. <laughs> God has been speaking, as Hebrews 1 says, throughout history in varieties of ways. And in John 1.14, we have God's final word, firstly on who God is, and secondly on who man is. His opinion over who we are is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. The word become flesh, dwelling among us, and we beholding his glory, full of grace and truth. And then we enter into that conversation. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. He says, it started when God said, light up the darkness. <laughs> That's a quote from Genesis 1, verse 3. Then he goes on to say, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. It's a discovery that you need to make, and it changes the way you see yourself and the way you see life. We're in the middle, as Top said, in a conversation as a family, and in fact, the, the, the conversation is not just a four-week conversation, it's a three-year conversation. We started last year talking about the new covenant, the, the, the faith that is foundational to the way we engage with God. We don't engage with God on the foundation of my labor determines his favor. We're not there. We've, God has set us free from that mindset. We've stepped away from an old covenant recipe theology. We'll go there in a minute. We'll talk about recipe theology just now. We're stepping away from that. We've stepped into the grace, the love, of God revealed through Jesus Christ. We've stepped into that embrace and we have become sons and daughters of the living God. We've entered into the new covenant. We've embraced the new commandment. That's the conversation we're having this year as a congregation. And that's gonna set us up, I'm sure, to be able to invest in this world, bringing hope into everything that God wants us to engage in. We have a faith-based relationship with God. We have a love-based relationship with others. And we have a hope-based approach, approach to this life 
in this world. So that was just to give you context. And uh, for some of you, context is like this confusing picture that you may see. Stefan, let's have slide seven there, please. Uh, sometimes you know, there are so many lines of communication and conversation happening. Uh, you've gone as, you've, that's the one. It feels like, man, I'm in the middle of so many conversations, I don't quite know what the focus is. Well, let's help you this morning just by going one step further and say, okay, the focus this morning, the conversation is on love. Thank you, Stefan. And you know that to live in love, to find yourself in the center of God's favor, to see yourself there, my picture here, that is where the conversation is going to be this morning, the love of God. And we know now that slide, thank you, Stefan, slide nine, love, to live loved is to live a revolutionary life. So we're talking this morning from... um, I'm taking you to Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Those of you who know this part of the Bible will have, uh, you will remember, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's much to say there, but uh, let's first begin by introducing the, the tension that this passage of Scripture brings to mind. It's firstly a conversation on a new commandment, a new way to love. Now, maybe we should just define new before we go too far here. Sometimes people think better is new. Um, You've seen the adverts, new, improved, this and that and the other, whiter, cleaner, better, whatever. And you're thinking, but it's the same old thing. It's just one ingredient added and now it's a whole new thing. This is not the way God deals with us. This is not the approach that God is taking when he comes with a new covenant. May I add my concerns to this conversation? Some people think that because we have the Bible in two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament, old and new, uh, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, some people think, okay, it's the same thing. The way the Old Covenant works, the New Covenant is now it's not just for Jews. Now it's for everyone. Okay, so the New Covenant is now broader, wider, more inclusive than just for the Jews. But it works the same way. We still have to do what God expects of us to do. We have to keep the law. We have to make sure the Sabbath, all of that tithing, all of that kind of stuff. But nothing could be further from the truth. God is not inviting you into the kind of covenant he had with Israel. I want you to know that. And maybe let me share my concern with you is that when we read the New Testament, we read it through the lens of the old covenant. I want you to hear there's a difference between a covenant and a testament. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. Tops mentioned it last week. A testament is an inheritance. You do nothing for an inheritance. You get born into a family. And when somebody who has a lot of money dies, you are the beneficiary. That's all you need to do is identify yourself and show up for the benefits. That's all you need to do. This is the essence of the New Testament. It's not a covenant. My wife and I entered into a covenant agreement, but we drew up a testament. My son, one day when I'm no longer there, I'm not going to, there's no expectation on him to have to fulfill the duties that I agreed to as husband to my wife, provider, etc., etc. My son will not have to fulfill those duties. There's no expectation on him to do anything I agreed to do in this relationship. His relationship with his mother is an entirely different thing. There's no expectation on him from my side or from his mother's side. All he's going to do is he's going to inherit what I've decided I want him to have. So if you're entering into a relationship with God thinking that God's expectation on Israel is also his expectation on you. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is the nature of the New Testament. It's totally different from the nature of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant had a purpose. It had an outcome. And when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he meant it. It's done. It's dusted. It has completed It's purpose. We don't need to keep it running. It's done. 
some of you might be a little confused now. It's probably because you haven't heard this before and you're thinking Old Testament, New Testament, same thing, just new, you know, wider, better, bigger, whatever. It's like, you no, know, the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament, is not like, you know, you have this horse and cart. So the, the Old Covenant is this horse and cart. The New Covenant, bigger horse, bigger wheels. We can go further. No, it's... No. <laughs> The difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, like Old Covenant, horse and cart, New Covenant, space shuttle. Yay. <laughs> two different modes of transport. Both transport, but two entirely different modes of transport. Space shuttle doesn't have the kind of limitations that the horse and cart has. Horse and cart won't get you to the moon. Old Covenant won't get you into the throne room. Oh, old covenant will not take you where God designed you to live. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Hebrews 8 tells us, verse 6, that God, Jesus Christ, is the mediator of a better covenant based on better promises. That word better, it's an exponentially different kind of relationship. This is where the new covenant, the New Testament is taking us. Jesus comes and he shares with us in Luke 10. Well, Luke takes us to an encounter that Jesus had with someone who had difficulty making that transition out of a my labor determines God's favor kind of thinking into, but you are loved, therefore you can love and you've been designed for love, this is the lifestyle that God wants you to live. I also want you to realize that before we read this, uh, there are two questions that Jesus is answering. If you're gonna read that parable and get to the end and think that Jesus is answering one question, no, he isn't. There are two questions being asked here, and Jesus is answering them both separately. So at the end of the parable of the Good Samaritan, when he says, go and do likewise, do likewise we'll, we'll spend a moment on that and we'll, dis, we'll discover what question Jesus is actually answering at the end of the parable. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you. I think you, you have access to Bibles. Those of you who are on the Bible plan, going through, you're enjoying it. Good stuff, right. Um, for those of you who have heard the story of the Good Samaritan, you feel, oh man, I wasted my time this morning. Um, I'm coming to church and they're telling me the same thing over and over again. You're welcome to get onto the Bible plan and go read where you feel you need, you need to read. <laughs> While you're here, use the time to your advantage. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't let me interrupt your relationship with God, okay? But for those of you who, who are here to hear what's in this parable and maybe you'll pick up something fresh, let's dive into it, okay? The first question we find in Luke 10, verse 25, um, here on slide 14, I think it is. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him the question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And we find Jesus doing what he seldom does when he engages with the Pharisees. Most of the time, he's on them. He challenges them. He's pushing their buttons. But this particular incident, we find this guy standing up to test him, ask him a question, and Jesus kind of, you know, he just kind of steps to the sidelines, you know. Um, he's not answering him directly. He's throwing the ball back into his court. It's like Jesus is saying, Buddy, you want, this, you want the spotlight. I'll step aside. You come and you tell us what you are convinced is the truth. I'm not going to fight with you here. This guy's not looking for answers. When he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's not looking for answers. He's looking for an argument. And Luke tells us that. This man stood up to test Jesus with this question. Jesus is not taking the bait. Jesus is stepping aside. He doesn't have a reputation to protect. He doesn't have anything to prove. <laughs> you know what being of no reputation is all about, right? Nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to hide. That's Jesus. So, here he is revealing his old covenant mindset. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
You see where he's thinking? I've got to do stuff to get God to do stuff for me. And if I do my part, God will do his part. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He's thinking recipe theology. You know recipe theology, don't you? It's giving me the tools, the tips, the techniques to be able to do better or to be able to feel better. I want to go to the Bible. My money is not working out. I need to find out what God has to say about money. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do this. The problem is, if you think that doing what the Bible says will get God to give you money, I think you're coming at this from the wrong angle. I think you know, as Ephesians says, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. My, when my son was four years old, he wanted a drum kit. I know what drum kits cost. And I know as a four-year-old, he won't be able to deal with the size of the investment. So we started him out on a very limited kit, which was kind of, you know, it was a gift. One of the guys gave us a gift from the church. said, man, your son is keen, let him use. And so we developed as he grew in responsibility, as he grew in skill, as he grew in maturity, the investment into that particular drum set increased. At the moment, I think he has a couple of drum kits and put together, they probably are about as much as what our car costs or even more, <laughs> you know. God is sometimes grooming us, growing us, developing us into places of responsibility that if we don't nail the small things with discipline, he's probably not gonna shower us with big bucks. So if you say, you're going to do this and then God will give me big money, you're coming at this from the wrong angle. You're using recipe theology. It's old covenant thinking. It's cause and effect thinking. If I do ABC, God will do X, Y, Z. Paul comes down on the Galatian church for thinking in those terms. He's saying, guys, you started out so well. And you allowed yourself to be drawn off course by dropping into this mentality of, I have to do my part so God can do his part. He says, guys, good behavior will never bring God's favor. In fact, the greatest affirmation of the favor from the Father was over his son, Jesus Christ, when he came up out of the baptism pool. Uh, he had not yet done one miracle. He had not said, preached one sermon. And the father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The affirmation of the father is not dependent on your performance. He has chosen you. He loves you. He wants you to know that. And his love for you is unconditional. Now, some people get kind of all tied up in this unconditional thing. What does it mean, unconditional? It mean I don't have to do anything. Of course, you have to respond. But there are no conditions that you first have to meet. Before God will love you. Those conditions, there are none. God has chosen to love you even before you took your first breath. So the question that this guy is coming with, what must I do to inherit eternal life? His perception of eternal life is also kind of skewed. He's thinking, as they did in that particular frame of reference, one day when I die, I will get so, he's, so what must I do now so that I get rewarded one day when I get to heaven or that I don't get punished and sent to hell? What must I do? How must I avoid hell, be able to make heaven? And Jesus is saying you're thinking in the wrong terms because Jesus defines life in John 17 verse 3, eternal life. He says in John 17 3, this is eternal life that they might know you, Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the essence, the core, the access point into eternal life, knowing God. No God, no peace. No God, no peace. <laughs> eternal life is to be spiritually awake spiritually alive, awake, aware of who God is and what he's doing in relationship and communication with him. To be in mentally, emotionally aligned with his character, his nature, and to be physically active, practically expressing the heart of heaven into the challenges of life on earth. 
And unless we make that transition out of old covenant thinking into New Testament thinking, we're not going to be able to do what he's called us to do. So the guy answers the question. He asks the question. Jesus says, so what do you see in the law? What is that telling you? He answers and Jesus says, you're so smart. But then Jesus says something he probably shouldn't have done. He says, you know it, so go and do it. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> now he's pushing back. The lawyer is saying, okay, so, mm, okay, do what? Love my neighbor? Yeah, love God, there's no problem there. We know which God we're supposed to love. But love my neighbor, now, th this is a tricky one. So he says to Jesus, okay, uh, we picked that up in, the, in, verse, uh, in verse 29. The man wanted to justify his actions. I love the way they use the word actions there, I think Jesus was challenging him on his inaction, what he's not doing. Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, so who is my neighbor? Jesus has already answered the first question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer, love God with all your heart, all your mind. Love God and love your neighbor. So he's answered that first question already. Now, the second question, so Jesus comes in a roundabout way, like some preachers sometimes do. In a roundabout way. This guy's asking a question, and Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Why tell him a story? The guy wants an answer, doesn't he? And now you're going to tell him a story. Why did Jesus use parables, by the way? Most of us have grown up thinking Jesus uses parables because he wants to illustrate a spiritual principle for us out of a story about everyday life. But Jesus is using parables for a different reason. If you look at Matthew 13, what Mark, is it Mark 4? Um, Matthew 13, 10 to 13. Mark 4, 10 to 13. Luke 8, 9 and 10, just a few chapters previously. Jesus chooses to tell stories because the people that he is dealing with, he says, they, they have eyes, but they're not seeing. They have ears, but they're not hearing. Their hearts have been hardened. They're not grasping what God is saying. Can you remember? Let's, let's take the slide off there for a moment. Can you remember David? Big worshiper. Yeah. Uh, lowest point on his life, yeah, Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. You know the build-up to that story, don't you? Firstly, he lets some responsibility slide. Then he allows temptation, his eyes, mm, there are options. Uh, and then he realizes, well, as king, he can exercise any option he wants. The problem is that uh, his selection of options begins to have implications. And so those implications become compound, and eventually he is complicit with murder, adultery, etc., etc., etc. He's in a bad spot. This man who was so in tune, who was so prophetically aligned with the agenda of heaven, is now at a very bad spot. And the prophet Nathan is given the command by God to go and get David out of his spot. So what does Nathan do? Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt repent. No, Nathan doesn't do that. Nathan comes with a story. He says, Dave, I need to tell you a story. Yeah, what? He says, you, you won't believe it. And then he begins to tell him the story about this, you know, this guy who has this one little... Hans Lamberki, oh shame, nice little fellow. And he, this, you know, this, so loved by the family. And then this rich baron who's living next door, he gets this guest and, oh man, this is a formality. So he steals the sheep and he goes and kills it and he feeds. And David, being a shepherd, understanding something of these, these dynamics, he's annoyed. He says, this guy, I'm going to sort this guy. Do you tell me who he is? I'm, I'm going to make sure this guy never gets away with that again. And Nathan says, you're looking at him. You are the man. 
Why did Nathan choose to use a story? Because in David's relationship with God, he had shut down the voice of the Holy Spirit. He chose not to listen what the Holy Spirit was saying to him. So he was not open to personal revelation. Thank you, Stefan. You can put that slide back up. He wasn't open to personal revelation. Secondly, he'd stopped reading his Bible. He was not being confronted with Scripture, the revelation of Christ in Scripture. He'd stopped reading the Word of God. All he was open for now was maybe through the general revelation of nature and life in general, maybe God would be able to get through to him. And Nathan piggybacked on that principle that God chooses to use stories to get through to people whose, whose consciences have been, in a sense, seared, who have shut down the voice of the Holy Spirit, who are not accessing the revelation of Christ through Scripture. Stories are amazing. They can kind of creep up on you and reveal things to you that you didn't realize, you didn't know, and you were not open to. So Jesus begins to tell this lawyer, this guy who was so steeped in religious tradition that he's not hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, he's not pursuing Scripture for the purpose of discovering, as Jesus says in John 5, 39 and 40, these Scriptures are testifying of me. He's not using Scripture for that purpose. He's not open to the revelation of Christ. In fact, he's standing in front of the living Word, and he's challenging the living Word with the written Word. Like, go figure, huh? Like that, you're going to win on that contest? <laughs> so Jesus begins to tell him a story about the Samaritan, this guy who's, you know, is on a journey, and he you know, kind of falls amongst thieves, and the thieves strip him of his possessions, his money, his clothing, all of that kind of stuff, leave him half dead, Hey, this begins to ring a bell, doesn't it? There was someone else who was kind of left half dead after an encounter with the thief who came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Him and his wife, they were stripped of their glory, and they had to hide and, you know, with fig leaves try and cover up the fact that they had lost the glory of God. So, yeah, you're starting to pick up the threads of where the story's going. So then the priest and the Levite and... Come and you know they they see and they are aware of, but they don't engage and they move on. And the Samaritan comes along. You know who the Samaritan is, eh? You know who Samaritans were at that stage. Yeah. So how did the the Samaritan nation come about? Well, the Babylonian captivity, when Nebuchadnezzar took guys like Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, took them out. The nobles, the guys who were, had potential, they were all gone. The dregs of society were left behind. The Jews that stayed behind were the foundation of the nation of the Samaritans. Because the king repatriated a whole bunch of people from other nations into that area to make sure that the Jews would interbreed and that the Jews would never again become a problem in that geographical region. So the Samaritans clustered around the city of Samaria, they became a nation of their own. They had Jewish roots, but they had Gentile blood. So they were neither accepted by the Jews because of their Gentile blood, nor were they accepted by the Gentiles because they had Jewish origins. Kind of sounds familiar. John 1, verse 11, he came to his own. His own did not receive him. Samaritan, he's, he's on a road from Jerusalem to Jericho. You know where Jerusalem is? The city of peace, the city of God, Zion, the glory, the temple, the presence of God. On his way away from to Jericho, Jericho, one of the lowest cities on the globe, beneath sea level, dead sea plains, Man, this guy's not going down to sea level. He's going below sea level. He's going to one of the lowest places on earth. Ah, so somebody going from the place that is filled with the glory of God to one of the lowest places you can find. That is not a good road to be on. 
And the guy who gets robbed and left half dead, the Samaritan comes across him. And he stops. What does he do? He pours in oil and wine and he binds up his wounds. Oil? Mm. We know. All of Scripture tells us. Oil. Picture of the Holy Spirit. Wine. Mm. Two possibilities. Power of the blood of Jesus to restore. Isaiah tells us by his stripes we were healed. Uh, blood, rev- the, the wine, revelation, knowledge, the, the revelation of who Christ is. All of that comes into the picture. Oil, wine, binding up his wounds, puts him on his own beast of burden. Doesn't Matthew 11 come to mind? Take my yoke upon you. Come on, be yoked with me. I am a beast of burden. I will carry your burdens. Peter invites us to cast our burdens onto him because he cares for us. Comes and takes this man and takes him to an inn. The inns on that particular road were actually just caves that were kind of bricked up in front with a window and a door. So he takes this man into the cleft of the rock and he leaves him there so that he can recuperate. And he gives the innkeeper two pennies, two pennies, each penny. A penny was a day's wage at that, at that time. He says, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. Two pennies, what was he thinking? Two days, he's probably gonna be missing for two days. On the third day, he's gonna come back and he's gonna pay for whatever it is that's outstanding and he's gonna settle the bill and this man is going to be restored to be able to continue his journey. So who's the Samaritan in Jesus' story? Every one of Jesus' stories, he is the central figure. Either he or the Father or the Holy Spirit is the central figure. Luke 15, three parables. The first parable parable about the lost sheep. Jesus himself is the shepherd going to seek and to save whoever's lost. The lost coin, the Holy Spirit, is the owner of the treasure of a human life, restoring it to its original position. Father running to meet the son who is returning after having rejected and rebelled against his father. Father running to receive him. Jesus is putting himself, father, son, Holy Spirit, God at the center of all of his parables. Here, the parable of the good Samaritan. Jesus himself is the good Samaritan. Okay, so this leaves, at the end of the story, at least this lawyer or this teacher of the law in quite a bit of a different, awkward position because Jesus asks him the question in a different way. He says not who was the neighbor of. He says who was neighbor to the one who had fallen among thieves. Okay, if Jesus is the good Samaritan, who's the victim on the road? Humanity. Mankind, you and I. Jesus, the good Samaritan, reaches out to fallen men and women who have been stripped of their glory, stripped of their clothing, stripped of their possessions, and left half dead. Jesus is reaching out to every life that is in that condition to restore, renew, revive. Okay. So the question, who was neighbor to the one who was in need, he's, the the lawyer puts two and two together, say, okay, I can see where you're taking me. It's obviously the Samaritan. He was neighbor to the one who was in trouble. So what does Jesus say to him? He's answering the question by saying, go and do the same. What do you mean, do the same? Well, be Christ to broken lives. Be the one who is despised and rejected. That's okay. The one who is probably not affirmed and appreciated and valued according to the standards of this world. Be that one. And take love to those who are bruised and broken and in need of grace and love. Be prepared to be the one who has no reputation, the one who is not the most highly favored in the community. Be prepared to be that one, to reach out so that my love can flow through you into their life. 
So the question, obviously, that we're left with is, surely the Old Testament covered this kind of love and engagement, love one another, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But you see, here is where the new commandment comes in. The standard of measurement to love as you love yourself is far too low for those kinds of situations. There's an incredible study that's been done on chimpanzees in terms of morality, community. Chimpanzees in community, what's the moral standard? How do they engage with each other? Amazing study that's been done. It's called Morality Without Religion. And the whole conversation boils down to two things. Morality when you take God out of the picture, boils down to two things, empathy and equity. Empathy, I feel for you, and I will engage because I can, I can, <clears throat> I can associate, I can, yeah, your feeling, I feel your pain. I engage because I feel your pain. Empathy. Equity, I see you are in need, and I have, so I will provide. Mor morality, through every religious system you want to go, you will find those two things, empathy and equity. So the Old Testament is based on empathy and equity. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Feel for them and provide for them, as you would expect to be provided for. But Jesus comes and he sweeps that off the table. He says, loving your neighbor as you love yourself is far too low a bar. Because empathy always reverts to envy. I feel for you when you have pain, I can relate. But when you are better off than I am, when you don't have pain, and when I have pain, then I envy you because you're better off than I am. Equity always, when you are at the center, when fallen man is at the center of this, equity always goes to entitlement. I have, you don't, but I deserve what I have. I worked for what I have. Why must I give what I have? Because you don't have. You have no right to take what I have. Equity always goes to entitlement when fallen man is at the center. Empathy always goes to envy when fallen man is at the center. Christ wants to take fallen man out of the picture and put the new creature in the center of the picture. We don't love one another as we love ourselves. We love one another as he loves us. This is where the new covenant, the new testament, the new commandment all comes together. God loved us, as Romans 5 says, slide 24, thanks, Stefan. Without, when we were without strength, when we were sinners, when we were God's enemies, God reached out to us. That's the way he is inviting us to reach out to those around us. This morning, maybe we should pull this together just with a couple of comments and say, okay, the challenge that we need to accept is to step away from old covenant thinking that what I do earns me the right to whatever it may be. We need to step away from recipe theology. I need to do better or I need to feel better. Step away from my labor will determine God's favor. You need to step away from that because it will destroy you. What you need to step into is not recipe theology but rest in me theology. Let's rest in what Christ has already done and said over us. Love as I have loved you. This is what we need to align our hearts and minds with. Get a grip on the way he loves you. 
then you will have a handle on how to love others. But until you have a handle on how he has loved you, you will be constantly trying to love others the way you love yourself. Lastly, maybe the third question that Jesus should have asked was, okay, so who does he want you to be a neighbor to? And here I can't help you. I can't tell you, your next door neighbor, the this, the that, the other, the colleague at work, etc. I'm very privileged. Uh, if, you, if I was sitting in the house and somebody said, you need to reach out to your colleagues at work, I'm thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> All of them are saved. I'm on staff in a church. I mean, like, great. <laughs> I can't do what you're asking me to do. Uh, so you need to go and hear from God. Don't, let, don't shut out the voice of the Holy Spirit. Ask him for personal revelation. Who in your sphere of influence does he love? And who needs to be loved to discover the way he loves them? They may be people who have been stripped of who knows what. People who are wounded, who are hurting, who are half dead. They may be those kinds of people. In your sphere of influence, he wants you to neighbor them. When, you're root, when, you, <laughs> when you are rooted and grounded in love, this kind of lifestyle becomes the new normal. If Jesus were to say to you, go and do likewise, what would you take out of the way the Good Samaritan reached out and loved his neighbor? What would you take away and say, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this? Let me give you four that just kind of surfaced out of, and I landed with this. You see, I see a Samaritan who was not just concerned, but who had compassion. You've heard that before? I think I was predisposed to notice that. <laughs> Secondly, he was more than just an eyewitness. Oh, something terrible has happened. I need to tell somebody. It was more than just an eye. Ooh, photo. Ooh, ooh, yeah. He was more than an eyewitness. In fact, he put his phone down and he got his hanky out and he started helping this guy who was bleeding. More than an eyewitness, he actually made contact. Thirdly, he did what he practically could to bring relief to that man's situation. It was, you know, that man's restoration was a journey. It was a thing that would take time. But he engaged with what he had in the way he could somewhere on that man's restoration journey. And he left the rest to God. Fourthly, he was brought into this crisis in such a way that it actually cost him. Do you think he had money to throw around? Do you think he could put people up in a guest house for two days? Probably didn't have that kind of money. He was probably just off of a business trip where he'd made just enough to be able to survive, but now this person is in need. So he took what he had and trusted God to fill up what he was now giving away. He had faith that God would provide what he needed while he provided what this person needed. Let me leave you with that this morning. Let's take a moment, just let's close our eyes, close our eyes, bow our heads, and let's allow the Holy Spirit just to come and settle some of the thoughts that he may have stirred as you were listening. Give him the opportunity to give you